Good afternoon, everybody. If you're in the East Coast, good morning. If you're in the West Coast, we're in the East. So for us, it's early afternoon. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Elena Reyes, and I am a clinical psychologist. I have been working with um, migrant workers for over 20 years. I'm a professor of psychology and the director of the College of Medicine in the Southwest Florida area. And we are located in Immokalee and have a partnership with the Healthcare Network, which is a federally qualified health center in Southwest Florida and Immokalee, home to the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And uh, Courtney Witt, Dr. Witt, is a clinical psychologist with specialty in health psychology and integrated health. And she is the director of behavioral health for the Healthcare Network. So we'd like to present to you some information that we think might be helpful in terms of implementing integrated care into the the primary health clinics. We are cognizant of the fact that we are in a, administrators. Um, so we're going to try and make this uh, sort of need to know uh, and not be very theoretical in terms of our approach. I do recommend that you ask questions uh, for things that may not be clear. And um, we will leave time at the end also to make sure that your questions are answered. So I want to start today by assessing uh, what is integrated care and how does your organization assess readiness for it of expanding and going in that direction. I want to list some resources in terms of your infrastructure that might be needed for a successful integrated care program. And then finally, go through a little bit of the different types of behavioral health workers that uh, are going to be needed if you're going to have this type of program. Um, if you're here, most of you know what integrated primary care health is, but I'd like to just review very briefly um, where we are in terms of these terms so that we're all on the same page and why it is that this is even important. So as you all know, behavioral health is the it's part of the general health, right? So we talk about it as a biopsychosocial model. And mental illness, however, is even though it's everywhere and it certainly is in our primary care settings, it often goes undetected and certainly goes undertreated by healthcare providers who might not be uh, trained well enough to recognize or to treat uh, some of the behavioral health conditions. And the majority of patients, when you refer them out from that primary care setting to specialty care, do not go. As a matter of fact, some of the national data shows that probably up to 80% of folks that you refer out are not going to go um, to a specialist if you refer them out of primary care. So de facto, the primary care setting is going to be the mental health system that we have to work with. Um, and up to 70% of primary care medical appointments actually have some psychosocial component to them. And a lot of the medications, as a matter of fact, over half of the medications that are given out that are psychotropic medications are actually prescribed by the primary care providers as compared to about 12% by specialty or psych psychiatrists. So integrated care has the potential for greater access to mental health services, as well as significantly decreasing the cost of care. So why is this important in our population? Well, uh, my friend and colleague, George Rust, who has many years experience, and some of you may know him with Migrant Health, said, well, you know, it's very difficult to have one physician in a room and it's just not enough when you are going to treat a patient. And as an example, to prevent complications of obesity and diabetes, there are just a few things you have to do. You have to modify a person's health beliefs and attitudes, their daily habits, their eating preferences, daily activities, their exercise habits, the grocery stores in their community, whether the neighborhood has walkability, food advertising, self-care, employability, economic empowerment, access to medical care, clinical inertia, provider quality and medication adherence. And it's all should be done in the context of his or her family and social relationships. And oh, by the way, let's give our physicians 15 minutes to handle all of that. So as we know that that is just not gonna happen, right? It's quite impossible for that to happen. And so in comes integrated care. And so we have different models, clinical pathways and perspectives on how to do this. So what we're gonna be talking about is from the perspective of the model of the primary care behavioral health. And while there are different clinical pathways to get there, 
uh, our perspective that we're going to be talking today about is the clinical health psychology or medical psychology perspective of how you can have behavioral health consultants that have training in health psychology that can extend the work of those primary care providers and become part of the team so that the physician is not burdened with something that's really quite impossible to do is to take care of the whole patient. And the primary care behavioral health model um, some of the essentials so that we're all on the same page again. We're talking about the standard behavioral health screening for patients that come in. We're talking about unified treatment plans and treatment plans that have actionable screening results. So when we screen, we do something about that. We don't just stick it in the medical record. We have protocol that's based, care, protocol based care for delivery of treatment. And we have a very importantly, a common electronic health record. So the psychologist can see what the physician is trying to do and the physician can see what the psychologist is trying to do. So it is not that um, behind closed doors medical record for the psychologist that the physician cannot access. And we have this all in treating the mind and the body or a patient-centered care approach to our patients. We're, there are plenty of studies, I'm not gonna go into them, but there are, there's plenty of research now that we have on the effectiveness of integrated care. And the meta-analyses that have been done have been both for adults and child and adolescents, showing that this is a very effective model, not just an improvement of symptoms and care, but in patient satisfaction and ultimately, and trying to be more efficient and effective in terms of finances. So we're effective in decreasing symptoms of behavioral problems that often are maybe a bottleneck to specialty care. So things like anxiety, depression, and improved functioning uh, can be actually handled in primary care with a behavioral health consultant so that we're not sending over to specialty care or the community mental health centers so many patients that then they are blocked and can't see some of the more severe patients. Uh, and adherence to chronic disease management, whether that is asthma or diabetes, obesity, generally improvement in chronic disease um, are things that we know and the research is showing to be effectively focused with this model. For our Latino populations, taking into consideration that I know that not the migrant centers have a lot of other patients, for example, in ours, we have a, a Haitian population that are agricultural workers that we also use this model with. But in terms of the research that's coming out in terms of the integration for Latinos is actually um, something that we really want to look at at opening access to care. This kind of a model is very problem focused. Um, so it is very much on demand. You see patients when the patients are needed as a warm handoff, which means that the physician is going to introduce the provider to that patient. The short visits that are over several weeks, uh, it's gonna decrease stigma, manage chronic, man chronic disease, which is gonna get help in terms of decreasing health disparity and overall improved satisfaction. And we'll go through some of that. You know, Latinos are problem focused. Uh, our mig migrant workers are out in the field working. They don't have time to be coming in once a week for a 50 minute hour as in traditional psychology. Um, they don't even know uh, why they're being sent. Uh, they don't think they're crazy. So why should we go to a psychologist? So there are all sorts of reasons why an integrated care model is really much more effective for our migrant workers. I always tell my trainees that you never allow your patient to leave without taking something with them. So they come in, they've missed work for the day, they don't have money for that day, they say all of these problems to you. And in a traditional setting, you basically say, well, thank you very much for sharing everything about your childhood and everything that worries you. And I'm gonna take a look at this and come back next week. And I'm gonna tell you at that point what the treatment plan is gonna be and what we're gonna do. Well, the patient walks off with, why did I come here to begin with? I didn't go to work and they still didn't tell me what was wrong with me and what we're gonna do about it. And so the idea is that no matter what, you know, this patient is worried and is having problems with sleep. So we need to do something so that when they walk out of the clinic, they walk out with something, something that's going to help them sleep better 
tonight. And so it's very focused on the problem. It's very functional. And they have under, been introduced to the psychologist, not as the three-headed monster that they don't know who it is out in some specialty clinic, but rather, oh, this is the colleague. This is the team. This is the colleague of the primary care provider who's going to work on this together with the primary care provider. So it's a very friendly approach, I think, to the migrant population. Um, the national samples of Latino, and we're talking now especially immigrants from Central America, uh, are less likely to meet criteria for a mental disorder, uh, more so than non-Latino or U.S. born. They have a lot of stressors, but oftentimes they, those stressors don't quite meet the diagnosis, and they're just going on, and they're dealing with life because that's what they have to do. And I know that a lot of times they come to the clinic and you think, oh my gosh, how can these people go on living? How can they just be functioning every day? They've gone through so much, and they continue to go through so much, and they just say, bueno, es la vida, you know? Dios me lo puso y así estoy. This is life. Um, I just have to deal with this. So they don't necessarily uh, meet disorders uh, criteria in the DSM, but they certainly have a lot of the symptoms and some of the stressors in life that we do need to address. Uh, so they're less likely also to utilize the specific mental health services from specialty care. And they're less likely to receive evidence-based treatment, and we've known that for quite a long time, uh, just because there are not enough treatments out there or psychologists or mental health workers that are able to linguistically adapt the good treatments that we have up there and not able to adjust to be culturally appropriate for the evidence-based treatments that are out there. So the result is that you have disparities, you don't have enough therapists, you don't have enough of the appropriate treatments that we can offer to this population, all of which makes integrated care with health, psych, or behavioral consultant on board to be a much better model to deal with chronic disease management and mental health uh, for our migrant population. So as administrators, what do we need to do in terms of, well, are we ready? If we're going to go into this, if we're going to dive into this integrated care world, how ready are we as an organization to do this? And there is plenty of research on organizational readiness, which is the extent to which an organization is willing and able to implement a particular innovation. And organizational readiness, as administrators know, have three components. So you have the motivation to implement. So are you perceiving this innovation to be a good thing, an incentive, um, or what are the disincentives for implementation? What are the general capacities that the organization's structure and function and the cultural aspect of the organizations have to be ready to implement? And what are some innovation specific capacities? So do we have the behavioral health consultants already? Do we have the health psychologists already on board or not that can implement some of these changes? And HRSA has a toolkit that you can look at the, with four organizational integration readiness uh, components. And you can all look to the website. It's set from the Center for Integrated Health Solutions. And you can look at the different things that you can do as an organization to assess for your readiness. But you can go to that website yourself and you can access that all of yourself. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to focus on one organizational readiness that I think is the best for federally qualified health centers because it's very practical, I think, um, and this is my opinion about it, but the um, Readiness for Integration Care Questionnaire, which came out in 2017, it's adapted to integrated the integration of behavioral health and primary care. So it's not just a readiness of an organization in general, but it is adapted to, it's focused on integrated behavioral health in a primary care situation. Um, it was supported by the, Kaus the Kaiser Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It uses a health equity lens initially for the clinics in Georgia and the primary focus for integrated care that, there. But it emphasizes the creation and advancement of opportunities for underserved populations that are predominantly minority and low-income patient populations and under-resourced clinical settings um, that would like to optimize health outcomes. So therefore, 
given the development of this questionnaire uh, through these lenses, I think that they fit very nicely into a, an, a readiness assessment for a federally qualified health center. Um, you can find the actual questionnaire, the 82 questions in the Journal of Orthopsychiatry in 2017. And the three components um, does follow what general readiness talks about, which is the motivation th that is there, the innovation specific, the capacity and the general capacity of the organization. But it allows the leadership and administrators to pinpoint specific areas of change that are needed based on data informed decisions and how to allocate limited resources based on the results of those 82 questions. And it's important to remember, and this takes into consideration, that organization readiness changes over time. So they might be ready to change one aspect now, but three years from now, we're ready for the next change. And there's gonna be a difference in culture, maybe because of change of administration, whatever it is, but it's not a static concept. So readiness changes over time. And the instrument is designed to also facilitate quality improvement activities and capacity building. So when you look to see, okay, where are the gaps in our organization? What do we need to fill out if we want to go into an integrated care model? You also have an ability to work with that over time for QI to see how your improvement in that readiness and in that implementation. So Given that this uh, is able to be used within a QI setting also, it talks about increasing staff capacities. What folks that have used it have found is that um, it assesses general skills and knowledge about the capacity of your workers in that organization to be able to implement. Also, it talks about improving access to and the use of resources. And it has found that simplifying steps in integrated care so that the effort appears less daunting um, and difficult to team members. So if you can break it down into rather than we are going to now change into integrated care, but specific aspects of it, it's a less daunting um, exercise for the clinic to have. And so it makes it a much better instrument to use. When explaining to the clinic, this model, and to the everybody's staff in the clinic, um, Robinson and Ryder have come up with this mnemonic called GATHER. And I think it, it offers a nice little overview and an operational definition of when we're talking about integrated care, how the staff and, and administration needs to think about it. One, it's that it's a generalist approach. So behavioral health care engages with patients of all ages in this model. So from the six month old baby that comes to the door that needs a developmental assessment or that the parents need some help with parenting, all the way through the geriatric patient and the family that needs help with transitioning, for example, into nursing care and having a family meeting about it. And in between the patient that needs uh, is 42 years old and really needs to manage the diabetes, his diabetes in a different way. So it's a generalist approach across the lifespan and across physical and mental conditions. Another important piece for all staff members to understand is that accessibility. What really makes this model work is that the behavioral health consultant is available throughout the day for warm handoffs. And warm handoffs is the ability of the physician to pick up on something and say, hey, I need the behavioral health consultant to work on this with me and to be able to go down the hall and knock on the door and say, hey, come on in. I need for you to see Ms. Smith. Um, introduce the behavioral health consultant and say, hey, this is, you know, Dr. Perez, she works with me on behaviors and diabetes, I'd like for you to work with her so that we can all work on the team. What that does is that right away, it shows that Dr. Perez doesn't have three heads, psychologists are not that scary, uh, doesn't mean that you're crazy, it means that they're going to work with you on your diabetic care. And so already you're starting a relationship right there. And the psychologist can do a very quick assessment that only takes a couple of minutes and walk the person over to them if needed uh, to make the appointment for the next time they're going to come in. And that person leaves, that patient leaves with something in their hand. 
understand of, oh, this is the next thing I'm going to do. I'm going to work with this behavioral health cons consultant for this condition. Also in this model, there's very high productivity. And so management needs to understand that this is a model that is not like the traditional care where the psychologist is gonna spend an hour per patient. This is a 10 to 14 patient a day model where the appointments are 15 to 30 minutes. And so it's very fast paced and everybody is working in a team together. It's not a psychologist at the end of the hall in a very private area and nobody bothers them. That's not this model. There's also the educator in the behavioral health consultant. So the goal is to help develop a uh, primary care milieu in which biopsychosocial influences on health are identified readily and they're handled comfortably by anybody in the primary care team. So if the nurse is um, going through a PHQ-9 to evaluate for depression as a regular yearly screening for a patient, and the nurse recognizes that the patient has endorsed a couple of items, rather than being neutral about it and just stick it into the health record, the nurse is emp empowered to tell the behavioral health consultant, hey, you know, Ms. Perez over in room three is endorsing some things in this PHQ-9 that I think you want to see her. So even before the physician goes into the room, the behavioral health consultant can go in and efficiently start to work with that screening and see if something else needs to be done. But everybody in the team is empowered to pick up on these cues. And also the fact that it's a routine. In this model, the PCP routinely calls on the behavioral health consultant. It's part of the regular workflow. It's included in the uh, routine of certain conditions. So everybody knows that a child who's got an attention deficit disorder, there's a certain routine, certain things that are always going to be done with the newly diagnosed child. So this is the team. When we say it's a routine and everybody's involved, who are they? the primary care physician, the behavioral health consultant, nurse, the frontline staff that are doing appointments or checking people in, a social worker that may be working to get referrals into the community and, and um, resources that the patient may need, promotoras that are out in the community as behavioral health promotoras. And this is like my, my goal in life is that before I die, we are going to have in every community that has a migrant community, behavioral health promotoras. And just like the promotoras that help us with diabetes care, these promotoras are going to be out there destigmatizing behavioral concerns, having people recognize when they're not just tired that maybe they might have depression and that they can go to the clinic just the way that they go to their behavioral health, uh, I'm sorry, to their primary care clinic when they've got chronic headaches and that they can get it checked out. Um, and then finally, in some models, you're going to have a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner for medication management. Not that they will be there full time, but that they are there as consultants. So in some clinics, they come in once a week to consult with the physicians that may be usually handle anxiety or depression, but in this case, there might be some comorbidities of some physical conditions that they would like a consult from psychiatry on how to best manage this and then keep going. Um, sometimes this is done uh, remotely with the psychologist reviewing the record with a psychiatrist that is remote and that psychiatrist is going to write a note in the record so that the primary care physician is able to follow up. Um, but again, these are their team members and, and some have all of them, some have less of them, but these are the potential team members that we're talking about in this kind of a model. The training for the model for your clinics really needs to have the administrators involved, top leadership, and the role of the leadership is endorsement, is endorsement that this is the way we're going to go. Everybody from the CEO to the chief operating officer, the medical director, the director of nursing, the IT people and the people involved with everything having to do with the electronic medical records, that they're all in it as the clinic transitions into a behavioral and integrated behavioral health clinics so that the messaging that's going down is we're in, we all are in this together. We all want all staff to have this model, all of the physicians, everybody to have this model.
It's a great idea to sign a, be a consultant, a behavioral health consultant that is someone that has been trained, a psychologist that has been trained in a health psychology model and can serve as a consultant to the whole team of administrators as they're moving in this direction. Uh, highly recommend a visit to an established clinic as a team, not just sending your behavioral health consultant, but if you can at all go as a team and spend the day so that you can have your counterparts at that clinic that are in administration be able to share with you how the model runs in that clinic. That really is the ideal. And starting implementation one clinic at a time. Um, what is really works well um, is to take one clinic if you are in a variety of clinics, have it work well and then expand to other clinics or even one program. For example, I'm gonna show you later on an example of one program that we have for screening in pediatrics. We started that with screening using only one physician. And once that physician and that team were all ready to go, then we expanded it to the other five positions in the clinic. So this helps everybody get on board. It also helps everybody to have buy-in because if you say we're going to do it with one physician and we're going to work out the workflows and we're going to get input from everybody on how this is going to roll out, then you try it for a month and see how it works. You're only trying it with one physician and and if it doesn't work or if there are problems along the way, you can fix it and then go ahead and try it again with the upgrades. And once you've got it down, then you roll it out to your other physicians. We have find that this model works well. And from the very beginning, we want to make sure that we have been able to generate and review reports from the clinic so that you can tell that this effort that you're doing of having integrated care, is it working or not? You know, are we there yet? Are we working on metrics that let us know that we're not just a regular clinic, but we're an integrated care clinic? How will you know that? Um, how will you know that you're there? So in supporting this kind of practice management, you're shifting some of the biopsychosocial health care from your physicians so that it's increasing efficiency. The physician can go to the next room and have the psychologist working on the anxiety that is causing the headaches in this particular patient. Um, behavioral health care works in, in a, the assigned clinic area in this model for this practice that is part of the entire team. Again, they're not at the corner, they're not in an isolated area, uh, they're part of the clinical area. Um, also good to know that in, in this, in a good model of integrated care, up to 20% of the time of that behavioral health uh, consultant is going to be spent on group-based care. And that's a very good model for efficiency. So if you've got a diabetes group, if you've got a group of patients that are um, HIV positive and you're trying to follow them, that having them uh, do that in a group-based care with a psychologist works very nicely. Um, importance that from the very beginning, the physicians, everybody understands that the behavioral health consultant in that role is not a psychotherapist. They are not going to spend six months working on a weekly basis with someone. Um, this is very important, particularly for acceptance from our population. As we all know, our agricultural workers don't have time to come every Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon to do an hour's work of psychotherapy. That's just not a realistic model, right? Um, so practice management needs to understand that this is a different model. It's a different beast we're talking about. About half of the time of this consultant is gonna be spent in that clinic managing the warm handoffs that the physician is gonna give. And very, very important, as we said, and I keep reiterating it, that that electronic medical record is gonna support this type of practice management for efficiency and for billing and for your metrics that you're gonna to wanna to use to know that these things are working. So how do we know um, that we're there? How do we know that we are using the kinds of uh, metrics to tell us whether indeed uh, we're using a primary care behavioral health model in our centers? Um, so we wanted to give you some examples of some of the things that Healthcare Network that are used and Dr. Witt as the director of behavioral health is gonna share some of that with you. 
Thank you, Dr. Reyes. So this will just be a nice snapshot. This is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of creative and really meaningful ways to measure and monitor um, the uniqueness and impact of primary care behavioral health. So I'll just go through a few provider system and then some quality level metrics that we commonly go to in practice and are really nice um, starting ground. So at the provider level and paralleling our medical colleagues and just the fee-for-service landscape that we, we do exist within, we do have to look at the total number of visits by provider and as a total department. This is commonly discussed as productivity, but it really is about access and reach when you think about it and utilization of this really essential resource. We track the total number of visits on a weekly basis um, and examine that in relationship to the provider's clinical time. But in um, 2019, about 40% of our behavioral health visits were uncompensated. So it is really important to also examine behind the scenes the total number of billable visits for budgeting purposes. For a clinical um, or full-time clinical provider at Healthcare Network, our expectation has been six billable visits per day and a minimum of three integrated or same-day visits. But this is currently um, under re-evaluation with some innovations and changes in billing practices that we've been able to implement. So we do see it um, approaching more of what Dr. Reyes was discussing, that 10 to 14. Another aspect to examine is scheduling efficiency. So this reflects the total number of visits um, filled that were available with a targeting of using 70% or higher. That can be slots for scheduled visits for those that need a handful of um, sessions to help work on you know, improving their adherence to diabetes treatment, helping with like insomnia, learning some strategies for managing anxiety or temper in the workplace. Um, and then we have as well available slots for those same day um, visits. So looking at the efficiency and how much those are being utilized. Now it can be human nature to fall into the path of least resistance or the status quo. So if the goal is one of integrated primary care or PCBH, we absolutely need to measure and track our model fidelity to ensure that we're staying on track. That can be met by examining the frequency of appointment types that you extract from your EHR system. So looking at the total number of same day visits, for instance, how many prevention visits were done, how many warm handoffs or consults, how many joint or dual visits in which, you know, the patient's scheduled to see both the PCP and the behavioral health provider, same place, same time. Uh, this next one is one that I'm really excited about and it is a little bit more in, in the works. Um, for implementation, but for our ongoing professional performance evaluation, we're actually creating a new metric um, that sets the expectation for the primary care provider and the behavioral health provider. Um, one metric, two people. So both have a vested role in utilizing um, the resources, working together as a team, um, because we know this, this model of care is the best care for our patients. So the behavioral health provider is responsible for, you know, going to their most difficult PCP um, who has the lowest utilization, utilization and really getting them on board to, um, to engage and utilize warm handoffs. And vice versa, the PCP will be um, compelled through performance expectations to use the behavioral health as a resource to increase our, our population reach. Um, when we routinely screen for traditional mental health and substance use concerns, we're going to identify a lot of traditional concerns and refer them to behavioral health. But part of our model, as Dr. Rhea has mentioned, really is that health psychology or behavioral medicine piece. So using the principles and intervention of psychology to promote health and lifestyle factors and manage chronic conditions like diabetes, COPD, chronic pain. So being able to pull data and track how behavioral health providers are being used to address these concerns is really important and has implications for such things as meeting HEDIS measures, which I'll talk about momentarily, or other quality measures. Um, another provider level metric is patient satisfaction. If we do not provide compassionate patient-centered care, we've got nothing. Our visits fall, our desired outcomes don't get met. So it's really important to um, assess patient satisfaction as you um, typically would do for your PCPs. So looking at such factors as provider listening, knowledge regarding health history, how we explain um, diagnostic impressions or recommendations or strategies so that patients can go out into their lives and act on them. 
um, and how we engage patients and the healthcare decision. So as Dr. Reyes was giving that example, we can give like a great treatment plan by the book, but like, can somebody, will that really work for their lives? And so being able to engage them and participating in and crafting something collaboratively that they can go out and execute and ideally have some success for. Um, so we provide that data directly to our providers for review, as well as include it as an ongoing performance evaluation on our, our OPPE process. Next slide, please. At a system level, and um, I think it's really thinking about behavioral health as direct providers, but also consultants to the system, not all of our efforts go or translate into direct patient care. Um, one way that we're able to support our system more now than ever is related to crisis support through an on-call program. Um, so one way that we're doing is using our EHR to create an order set for a brief crisis intervention. Um, if a behavioral health provider is not in sight, but a patient comes in and endorses suicidality, uh, the, the primary care provider will reach out to us and we'll help um, step them through the assessment um, and safety planning um, aspects of that intervention. So being able to create an order set that becomes extractable lets us see the volume of these crisis situations. It helps us see the frequency or any trends uh, over time, as well as get more information on the specific nature of the crisis, um, which could inform um, different patient campaigns, more staff training, or new clinical um, protocols. Population penetration. So this, the PCBH model, again, is not necessarily one of um, like traditional mental health. It is a population health perspective. How, and it becomes part of the GATHER acronym. How do we make this routine so that the patients of the behavioral health provider are the patients of the medical system? So looking at our population penetration or reach. So of those patients that were unique number of patients seen, um, in the medical center, how many had an established contact with a behavioral health provider? So if we think about one in six children, two to eight having a diagnosed mental behavioral or developmental disorder, about 50% of adolescents with clinically significant concerns, one in five adults with a diagnosable mental health condition, and as high as 50% of um, U.S. adults having a pre-existing medical condition like diabetes, hypertension, or obesity, you can imagine that our reach should be a significant one. In general, in the field, we try to, to aim for a population penetration of about 20% or one in five. Another um, system level aspect of PCBH is the association with provider or PCP, productivity, satisfaction, and retention. So that can be an important uh, metric to examine. So we actually have surveyed some of our primary care providers on um, their relationships and utilization of the primary care behavioral health providers in their clinic. And we found that 26% somewhat agree and 52% strongly agree that they're able to see more patients by virtue of having integrated behavioral health. This has implications not only for behavioral health access, but also access for medical appointments, being able to open um, them up to be able to take on another like acute care visit, um, for instance. 13% uh, somewhat agree and 74% strongly agree that having behavioral health on site promotes their job satisfaction. So one of our um, providers stated, having a behavioral health provider has made my job as a clinician easier, has improved my ability to assess and treat mental health issues, and has improved my confidence in prescribing medication for mental health conditions. They're an immense asset to our organization and our patients. Another primary care provider mentioned having them present is one of the best things I look forward to at that site. So if we think about provider burnout, if we think about how that can impact um, productivity, how it can lead to clinical errors, how it can lead to higher rates of retention, this is another impact um, that behavioral health can have in the system. In one of our clinics, um, and this is a, a uniquely productive um, pediatrician, but he has an incredible, um, highly efficient, integrated primary care team that he's been able to develop. And so on average, pre-COVID was able to see 35 patients a day relative to the average 17 to 20 of other pediatricians. Um, 
His estimate was that having behavioral health highly engaged through the warm handoffs and dual visits of PCBH, that he was able to see 10 more of those patients. So about 10, he could attribute to the fact that he had the psychologist um, on the floor that day supporting him in the assessment, uh, monitoring response to treatment, providing intervention um, that allowed him to, to see such a high volume. Next slide, please. And then quality. Um, so this is just another metric that's really important. So here you'll see very familiar behavioral health related HEDIS um, measures from NCQA. So there's the follow-up care for children prescribed ADHD medication at both initiation and continuation. Antidepressant medication management, again, at initiation and continuation and management. Looking at depression remission or response to treatment for adolescents and adults, and then follow up after the visit to an emergency room for a mental health concern or after hospitalization for a mental health or substance use concern. Generally, this information can be pulled um, from the EHR um, data, but insurance is also um, a lot of the managed Medicaid, for instance, in Florida, will send us um, data snapshots at the patient and provider um, aggregate level to see where we're following along these um, measures. Um, so behavioral health can meet this directly through their visit and documentation with the patient in some instances. So how we code or what CPT or HICPIC codes that we used for billing, we can pull um, and it'll satisfy this metric um, for our primary care provider. Um, we can also assist, for instance, one of the, the measures relates to depression remission. And so it's a pretty kind of high bar that, you know, that they'll continue the medication for six months. So we'll be able to work with um, assessing someone's motivation for a treatment course for that length of time. Or if they're ambivalent, how do we try a dose of behavioral health intervention before starting a medication first? Um, so just some examples of ways that we could meaningfully influence this quality metric. As a side note on the topic, I do just think it's important to highlight that this is another way that behavioral health can contribute to the generation of a revenue or kind of cost offset in addition to the standard fee for service um, that we're used to operating along. So these are ways that we can support the team. These are measures that they are held account to and based on their performance can be reimbursed um, certain quality dollars. And so if we're able to help satisfy these measures that translates to quality dollars for the organization. All right, and next slide. So we've learned a lot about the nuts and bolts of integrated care today, but what does this really look like in the real life, in the real world? So Dr. Reyes is gonna to bring to life um, some of the things we discussed with the case example. Dr. Reyes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Witt. So we've got all of this theoretical stuff, right? So what happens now? I've got my patient in front of me. We've got a federally qualified health center that has a really high need, low literacy, multilingual agricultural community. Uh, what, what do we do with them? I'm going to give you one example. We talked about routine screenings. Um, most of you have heard about adverse childhood events, and these are uh, adversities that children go through very early in life through their childhood that then has an impact on health in the long run. And they tend to be things like abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction, which is what the original studies of ACE showed back in the 70s and 80s. We know that for our population, we have other adverse events that are impacting uh, our agricultural families, things like deportation fears, document discrimination, uh, historical trauma, family separations, their transient lifestyle, and in inadequate housing. All of that can be just as detrimental as having a divorce in the family or some other household dysfunction. So we have a high need population in terms of their history of adverse experiences as children during their youth and adolescence. And so how do we get from those adverse events in childhood to poor health outcomes that then we need to deal with at the health centers? 
This is from the CDC, and most of you may be familiar with it. You have adverse childhood experiences that are embedded in the local context of social conditions that may be going on in that community, as well as the historical trauma of a group of people. Those adverse childhood experiences lead to disrupted neurodevelopment. Um, they're then caused impairment in social, emotional, and cognitive functioning. This in turn leads to difficulty in adaptation and in high risk behaviors that impact health and ultimately to disability, social problems and an untimely death. So this is why adverse childhood experiences are something that in a community health center where we have such high risk populations, we wanna do routine screenings about what's going on in the child's life and what could have happened in that child's life so that we can go into a universal prevention. Uh, Dr. Witt talked about population health. Very much population health is within the perspective of when you're using this model because you have a tiered system. You have universal preventive interventions, selective, and then those interventions that are indicated based on presentation. So talking about the first universal preventive interventions within a center, the first thing is, you know, my, my fantasy, right, of having all those promotoras out there in the community that are giving out general payer education, targeting health literacy for our population, whether it's at the at the community meetings or at the Head Start programs, at different places where they meet them. And that we, then we have universal screening during well child visits, and this is what we have implemented. So these are universal visits, uh, excuse me, screenings that the American Association or uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that pediatricians and primary care providers should really be screening during well child visits for adverse childhood events. These are, have been found to have such an impact on the lives of children in terms of their physical and emotional health, that it's become very important for them to do that. But of course, all of these academies are great about making recommendations, but they don't tell us how we're gonna do it, right? And so they don't tell the poor pediatrician how they're supposed to incorporate this into that 15 minute visit that they have. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about how we have done that. And then within the primary care uh, center, you then go into some targeted interventions that are developmentally appropriate, such as parent guidance, parent training, or management of asthma, of obesity. And then when you see that the, in your screening there is much more need, you can refer out to specialty care for some evidence-based interventions at that level. But let's go back up to, the, up to the green and the blue where we have our people that are coming in for their yearly uh, primary care visits. What can we do? Well, we found that it's important because of our population to screen and because of the Academy's recommendation that we need to screen, but how are we going to do that? So our aim was to identify children who had experienced traumatic events uh, with particular focus on physical, mental, or behavioral health needs. And so we were going to make this screening for these traumatic stress a ro routine part of well child visits. To that end, we developed an instrument that we could use. It's a kiosk, and we've called it the Multilingual automatic, Automated Screening System. And what it is, is a kiosk in the waiting room, and it's an iPad, if you will. It's, it's a tablet that you can place in place, and you can have a booth where parents and children come when they come to for their well-child visit, and they can complete a questionnaire for us. And what we've done is taken into consideration that we have English speakers, Spanish speakers, and in our particular health center, Creole speakers that we need to uh, deal with. We also have people that have very low literacy. In some cases, they have low literacy or no literacy at all. And so we have made it a way of um, reaching these folks so that they can complete their screening by using a headset that is audio and the questions will be read to them. Or the visual, they, there's a lot of visual um, information so and and stimuli so that the person will be easily able to follow what it's being asked of them. It starts 
with the patient being told through this that these are important questions, that their physician considers these important questions that have an impact on their health and that their physician would like for them to complete this and that they will have an opportunity to discuss this with their physicians when they go in. And once it is screened, and this takes about 15 minutes, uh, once it is scre the screeners are done, they are automatically scored and it goes then and placed in the medical records so that they're clearly available right when that pediatrician goes to walk into that office. They're also available to the nurse because remember we said this is a team. And so the nurse gets these and we have an algorithm that we've developed, a workflow of what happens when there's a positive screen and empowering the nurse to be able to do something about it, calling in the behavioral health consultant that has different options. And so when you screen and you have a positive, you can have a joint consultation between the behavioral health Health consultant and the pediatrician. Um, you can have the behavioral health consultant at all, alone taking care of whatever it is that the screening is showing. And you can have referrals to the community for resources if that's what's needed. Or in some cases, you can refer out to specialty care like the community mental health center if that is something that would be the best approach to take. So this is um, in, you know, 30 seconds, uh, the development and implementation of a screening program that is in an integrated care center, a way that is routine that happens, except when pandemic hits, in which case we're on pause right now, right? Because of not having too many people in the waiting room, but we will soon restart. But what we have done in our research from FSU's part is implementation research of trying to see how feasible is this in a busy practice with patients that are low literacy, physicians that are overwhelmed with a lot of patients, how feasible is it to do this? And what we're finding from our data is that, is that it is very feasible to do these routine screenings and to even use uh, electronic means to become more efficient with these screenings. The patient satisfaction is good uh, when we ask moms and uh, whether they were okay or not reporting on some of these stressful events in their life and their children's behavioral emotional difficulties to a computer. What we're getting is that they're okay with this, um, that in some cases it's easier to answer to a computer than to face a pediatrician and have to bring these situations up themselves for the first time, and that it is easy to use. Uh, we have done studies to see how long it takes, whether you're somebody that knows how to read or doesn't know how to read, how long does it take? And is this something that is going to interrupt or not? In our case, the workflow of the clinic so that you don't have pediatricians that are waiting because people are trying to complete a screening device. So all of this implementation and all of this workflow uh, accommodations are done before you do this. And this is why it's important to have, going back to the idea of implementation, having all administrators on board, from the CEO to the medical director, the director of nursing, that everybody is okay with this because there's so many steps along the way. In our case, this is electronically done. It doesn't have to be done, but we're doing it also for research. So when um, a screening is completed, that information gets placed in an electronic uh, serve, in a, a secure server for FSU so that we can do research and see if we really screen these children on a yearly basis, what's the impact that we're having on their health care and the difficulties that they're having. And if we follow them along their childhood and adolescence, what is it that we're going to be seeing along the way? Following the theory that if we can indeed do primary prevention early on, if we can intervene with parents and children early on, that the outcome is going to be better in managing their chronic illnesses or managing even before an illness is manifested by dealing with the stressors in the life of these patients early on and building resiliency and resources for them uh, so that they can then move on. So this would be one example. Um, we wanted to leave time for questions. We've said a lot of stuff, um, but we would like to take your questions if you would put them in the chat. We have somebody that's gonna help us with this and um, we will try to answer to the best of our abilities as we move along. Thank you, Dr. Rosado. They were, there were a couple of questions that came through. 
One um, was asking in Connecticut, we have PCMH and PCBHH, which are recognitions from NCQA for patient-centered medical home and patient-centered behavioral health home. Is this similar to your PCBH? Is this similar to your PCBH, similar to those recognitions? And, and, and they are, and, and we have, um, that's why I said this is, you know, they're different models, but some of the basic components of each model is that you have that integration of, of the of psychology consultant in, and you have a chronic management model and you have the physician and the mental health workers working together. Now, different models will have different licensed mental health workers, psychologists, social clinical social workers in their models. And this is important to know that if this is not necessarily the full domain of a psychologist, we, we do have a training program in our setting. And so we have all psychologists. The most important thing for all of these models is whoever you use as your mental health model is to have somebody that is trained in health psychology rather than in traditional psychotherapy, because that can be very confusing for the physicians to know when to refer someone to you, when to do a warm handoff, and when to go back to their old ways of referring out of the clinic into a, a, a different type of provider. Dr. Witt, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, a few things. So the question related to PCMH. So we have a primary care medical home or PCMH designation and our PCBH or primary care behavioral health operates under that. Um, so PCBH refers to our clinical approach and all the kind of the systems and infrastructure in place to support that. Um, but you'll find that they are very consistent with um, the PCMH standards in terms of you know, the coordination of care, like patient's active engagement, um, putting supports and resources um, in place to help patients um, reach their health goals or to follow through with the healthcare recommendations. Um, so very much, it's not uncommon to have PCBH under like a primary care medical home. Um, related to, um, I think we jumped ahead of the moderator a little bit, but related to this um, different levels of mental health providers that can operate within a system. Um, yes, Elena or Dr. Reyes, to, to your point, absolutely. And I, I think just a few additional um, things is that historically, but not exclusively, it doesn't have to be this way. A lot of the trainings for um, psychologists have been more formal for integrated care. We are seeing a lot of um, growth and change in that in terms of other master's level um, programs that are supporting training master's level students in this model of care. Another component too is thinking about the, the role of the primary care behavioral health that you want for your system or the provider you want for your system. Do you want someone that's specifically um, the provider or also um, some of those formal training opportunities for um, psychologists to date? Um, have been focused a little bit more on training for administrative functions and roles as well um, to managing some of the insurance pieces and some of the other intricacies of the how do we make this work. Again, a mid-level, master's level provider, a clinician absolutely could do a lot of these components and function really well um, in your systems to reach a lot of um, these really important health metrics and outcomes. Thank you, Dr. Witt. Yes, that was the other question, Dr. Reyes. So anything else that you'd like to add in terms of the role of staff or the benefit of using um, baccalaureate trained staff? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's so much the, the actual uh, degree, as Dr. Witt said, as it is the training in this model. And there is formal training. Um, it is some of the, uh, we have a postdoctoral health psychology program, but the movement in the country right now is uh, for psychology to have health psychology training at the graduate level so that they don't have to wait till internship and to postdoc uh, to get this training, but rather to be trained more in health psychology from the time that they're getting their doctorate degree. And there's also a movement towards uh, more licensing at the master level of psychologists that would be trained within this model that's not there yet, but the American 
American Psychological Association is working on that. Um, so again, I think that the key for you is that you, as administrators, is that you look for a workforce that either is trained or that you can send them for training in this kind of a model so that they are able to, if it's, if you're starting from scratch and you only have one person, that that person, that consultant can then um, eventually become themselves the provider, but can help everybody in the team to learn how this works. Thank you. And then we had one comment provided during the presentation. They indicated, this is such a great thorough overview of PCBH. I wanted to comment that the P that the BHC role can be fulfilled by any licensed behavioral health professional with sufficient integrated care training. In order to provide access to care, we should use the available workforce, which is not always doctoral level trained clinicians. PCBH models are very efficient using all types of behavioral health providers, including psychologists, clinical social workers, mental health counselors, marriage and family therapists, and when appropriate, clinical addiction specialists. Though there are some billing barriers depending on the provider, hopefully that will be addressed through upcoming legislation. Yes, and, and that follows up what I was just saying, that it is important. And there are some really good uh, training programs that are not, that, that um, for example, the in Massachusetts, uh, that as in the form of continuing education, so that even a clinical social worker that has been trained in a more traditional model can train in this model and um, through continuing education. And they have some, um, you know, consultation and that sort of thing so that they can implement the model uh, themselves. So you're right. I mean, there are different healthcare providers that can, and there are ways of training them so that they don't have to go back to school and get a new degree, right? But that they can get it through continuing education. Um, the point here, not necessarily the person, but the fact that they're trained in the model that works well. And I, I think it just speaks to the point of being kind of very clear about like bringing in behavioral health to your organization and what you want your model of integration, that person's reach and impact to be, that'll help inform you know, the type of credential provider, the experiences um, that you, or individual that you recruit for. Um, there was a question about having a bachelor's level trained staff. And I, I think just to that comment, like how do you envision using them? So um, in terms of helping probably with like some case management related services or more like psychoeducational pieces, potentially like parenting training or helping, you know, teach about um, medication adherence and schedules and things. Absolutely. If you're looking for um, someone that will step in that has the capability to do an informed clinical um, decision making, make a diagnosis, provide treatment recommendations, you will need a licensed provider that's a master's level or higher um, to be able to do that. So just uh, in thinking about what your needs are and letting that inform um, who you bring onto the team. At the same time, there are some uh, functions that a bachelor level person can do. Um, in terms of community outreach and training of the community level, like behavioral health promotoras, uh, as well as some developmental specialists that can work with um, babies and you know zero to three. And we're looking at a model like that also, where you are helping. Uh, you know, th there is in the age ages of zero to six, there is a movement nationwide that people should not be trained in silos. So whether you're in education or in psychology or in medicine or in social work, that there's some competencies that everybody in all of those fields should have in the development of a child zero to six. And so it, uh, definitely a bachelor level person that has been trained in development can very much help a pediatrician that's looking at helping parents to manage zero to six year olds and assess for development and what's on and what's off and what can be done. Uh, maybe do a home visit. Um, you know, there are things that definitely can be integrated into the team depending on the model that you want to use. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to welcome attendees. If they have any other additional questions, please go ahead and add them to the chat. 
we had a comment that uh, just came through. It says, thank you for discussing. I completely agree about the value of continuing education for master's level BCA, BHCs. And that helps to bring in the incumbent workforce to integrated care roles rather than waiting to do widespread integration because the integrated care workforce we need is still emerging. That's absolutely true. Workforce development um, is definitely something that we need. And we also know that in, in the placement for a lot of the migrant centers are often in rural areas, are often in areas that are difficult to recruit to. Um, but I want to point out what Dr. Witt was talking about in terms of provider satisfaction. And that if you are able to have this kind of a model, it makes working there a whole lot more fun and uh, stimulating and it, it helps you with retention. Um, you know, what I know that because we have so many problems with uh, behavioral health issues, physicians are overwhelmed. And to know that they have a partner there that they can collaborate with and the data in and day out of the clinic is something very appealing for them. Indeed, thank you both. Um, I don't see any other questions, any final comments that either of you would like to make to our audience? Well, thank you for being here. Our contact um, is in the program and we would be happy to talk to anybody that is brainstorming or thinking of going in this direction or maybe you're already there and want to expand. Um, we're happy to talk to, to anybody and thank you for being interested in this area. Absolutely. I just ditto all of that. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we're very passionate about this um, and believe wholeheartedly in it. So we're very um, always open to engage in creative ideas to, to make this work and to bring this to our communities. Thank you.